everyone. Welcome to Flutter Day Lagos. My name is Akin Jobi Sadiq, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, part of the things that we're trying to do with uh, the Flutter Day meetups is to try and bring the global Flutter Day celebration by the official Google team to different local, different local communities. And this is the Flutter Day meetup of the Flutter Lagos community. You can follow us on Twitter at Flutter Lagos, and we'll be having uh, three sessions today from three powerful speakers, uh, Femi, Jeremiah, and John will be joining us later. And then we'll be having uh, Slido games to see how we can win some prizes and just have fun. Uh, I'll be introducing the first speaker of the day to us. Uh, Femi Adegoke is a software engineer at Postagraph. His expertise include Flutter, Native Kotlin, Java, JavaScript, and he, li he likes watching movies, uh, most, uh, mostly political and detective movies. Uh, he follows sports, he explores history, and he watches documentaries in his spare time. His Twitter handle is at Adegoke Femi. So Femi, how are you doing today? I'm very good. Um, are you doing? You good? I'm good. Uh, so you love football. What football club do you support? <laughs> Real Madrid. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting. Galacticos. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so tell me today, you'll be talking to us uh, about. You'll be talking to us about how to understand animations in Flutter, and uh, this topic really interests me uh, because when we look at uh, animations is really a cool way to add some sweet things to your application and have some nice, nice designs. And I can't wait to see uh, all the things that you have for us today. So uh, I'll be I'll be leaving the screen over to you uh, so that we can get started. All right, I think we are all good right. to go. All right. Um, okay, yeah, so good day. Um, like I said earlier, my name is Femi Adegoke, and I'm a software engineer at Postagraph. And I'll be taking um, understand the um, topic understanding animations in Flutter today. Um, so um, you can see here, yeah, I'm software engineer at um, Postagraph. And um, what does this talk offer? Um, in this talk, um, what I'm basically going to be doing is um, um, understand the fundamentals of animations in Flutter and finding the best approach to implement your intended animations effects and a focus on explicit animations and a glimpse of transformer matrix for, um, for um, animations. Um, so choosing your approach. Um, Based on what type of animation you want to implement, there are generally two approach you can take. Um, use Rive, uh, formerly Flare or Lotte, um, if you are doing something around drawing-based animations. Um, so if the animation you want to implement seems more like a drawing, um, say you want to implement a switch, uh, a switch check, um, Nike just did ch um, check for um, a successful maybe transaction, for example, as like an indicator of to to your users about a successful transaction, and um, you want a sort of a fire animation around that switch logo. Um, you would normally do that using Flare. So you design your Flare um, stuff and import it um, into Flutter. I'm using the Flare um, Rive now. It's called Rive Rive plugin. Um, or look to any one of the two. Um, there's an example here um, that we can check. Um, this, for example, this animation here, um, this is straight from the Rive Studio. Um, you get the assets needed for this from your um, maybe designer. You most likely have that if you want to do something like this, or if you are the designer, yeah, that, that's cool as well. Uh, you get the animation, um, you get those assets, um, and then you use the asset to create um, this and then import it into Flutter. So it's supported in Flutter, so you can import that into Flutter. Um, so that, that is um, the first approach. 
Um, the second approach um, is uh, use explicit animation combined with custom painter. If you maybe um, you just don't have any other choice, maybe there's no designer to, to, to give you an asset and um, you want you still want to do that awesome design. Basically, you still want to do that awesome animation and you, you do this uh but take note that for this if not done properly it can cause performance issues um around um, maybe laggy screen and dropped frames and other sort of situation uh there's an uh, example here um that is done in code pen um so here yeah, you can see um this animation here um the rings here were designed did a very simple animation of course the rings here were designed using custom painter um the code can be seen here so you have a ring loading indicator which is everything put together um, um is the one handling the animation itself this ring lo loading indicator widgets uh the rings inside it um they are dashed, dashed circular in the internal one rotating and the um, external one rotating is basically um, a circular ring um what i call it and then the the sort of um rotates in different um we're using matrix four but we'll get to that later but yeah does does like the way they rotate around and all of this is controlled by one animation um controller um, one turn created from the animation and that is declared inside the main class the ring loading indicator class so yeah uh, that is that, that this is an example of a um doing something with custom painter and animation when you don't say have the assets to do that and um, this is very simple um you can do things a little bit more complicated than this and um have it that way so that that's the second um approach the third approach is using explicit or implicit animation this is the code based the two previous um two previous approaches were um one is a drawing based so like strictly drawing based the second one is a drawing based but you write it in code basically so using custom because it's just like a somewhere in between basically because the the is not um entirely um the expected way for you to do it right but it's it's a way out in case you don't you can't go through that expected way of doing it. so um the third one um, is the code based animation so if your animation is about animating widgets and their properties and all their properties um then you use a code based an animation so say you are animating the opacity of a widget you are animating the size of the widget you are animating the position of the widget along maybe um vertical or horizontal axis um those you use um code based implicit or explicit animations for that um so an example of a um an implicit um explicit animation type um so this this i call it rocking ball so it just bounces around um just on one horizontal axis um so it goes left goes right goes left comes right so th this is built with uh, an um, explicit animation so you can either you can either use to approach um i'm still gonna go into this in details so there are two ways you can go about implementing explicit animations um the there's a the using the inbuilt explicit animation um widgets some of them are like um, um fade transition um here you can in the code here we are using um you can either use a slight transition or a trans transform translate so um if i comment this out for example and i comment uh okay don't try an error uh so i comment this out back 
and then it should auto save and run. So this is using um, the inbuilt um, um, explicit uh, widget. So this slide transition has already been built for us. So we just use it uh, that way. And then if you want to use something that is not that, which is the transform translates that you just built from sort of from scratch yourself, uh, then you are good to go as well. So th this is supposed to show both the example for an implicit, um, a custom explicit animation and an inbuilt explicit animation. So um, that is um, one. Then implicit animation, uh, the, the example used here um, is basically the, the example given in that part. So you can see this in that part when you click, um, it just does that, just in this position. And yeah, this, and, this is something made with an implicit animation is the default. And um, you can go to that part and click on samples. Uh, you see it drop down. Um, you click on implicit animation, you get this and go to the code. They are basically using an animated align with an animated container. So um, implicit animation, um, it's an animation done by implicit admitted widgets. So there are a number of widgets um, that is provided to us by the Flutter team um, that, that you can use to, to animate without thinking too much about the controls. Um, and they are mostly widgets built on top, on top of their normal material widget we use every day. Like container, for example, we have animated container, uh, which is an animated version of container. We have animated opacity, which is an animated version of opacity widgets. We have animated align, um, animated version of align. So we have animated size, a lot of them. Um, most times if you want to um, build an animation, you want to implement an animation that doesn't involve a lot of control. Like you don't need to need it to run forever, for example. You just wanted to maybe um, just start and finish at, at a certain time. You don't need the control of it's been triggered by events or stuff like that. You can just use the implicitly um, admitted widget that is inbuilt into Flutter, and you are good to go. So, and it's quite easy to use. You just uh, put in, you plug in the, the the values you need, um, the parameters you need, and you are you are off. Um, you are good to go. Yeah. So th that's um, that's for the approach you want to choose so any of the the approach is good is, is good based on whatever you want to do so the first one was using rive getting the asset and building um a rive um asset for yourself in rive studio um and then exporting it to flutter um you do that for complex animations that are drawing bits some very awesome drawing based animation um you want to um, the second approach is you don't have necessarily have the assets that you need to build a rive um, version, a rive asset to export into your app. Then you can use custom painter to dig down, and sort of toil around creating those assets yourself in Flutter and then animating those assets. And then if you want to do um, stuff that can easily be um, regarded to as animating the properties of widgets basically say you have a row or a column you just want to animate its property or you have a container you want to animate its property you have an align widget you want to animate its property then you can go with, with an explicit and an, an implicit animation um so flutter and animations so flutter is built for animation because in essence Flutter draws its own UI, which means that it has full control of its build function, which can then be called many times in a second if need be. Being able to call the build functions multiple times in a second means that it can go through multiple frames in quick succession, usually 60 frames per second in a second. This is, in fact, what animations, um, including movies and everything, cinemas and stuff, it is about a quick succession of multiple static frames. So the movies you watch um, normally go to a cinema most cinemas run at 24 frames per second um most at least until recently so they run at 24 frames per second that's the that's actually the um lowest frame i believe for 
before you notice a lag, basically. So that's the lowest frame to uh, ensure smoothness to the human eye. So that's basically what they do with um, um, in the studio. So to, in, um, in the cinema, 24 frames per second, that's the lowest that you can visibly say that, okay, this is smooth, this doesn't look like static frames that were just, um, that are just passing quick succession. But in actual reality, um, animations, movie, and all of them are basically static frames that are going so fast, your eyes think that this is um, a movie, this is like moving and it's not a static frame, basically. So it's basically static frame moving in quick succession. So um, the in Flutter, this quick succession is mostly 60 frames per second, and I think that's the least you can, you can do, basically, because um, most mobile phones start from 60 frames per second and it usually takes the refresh rates um, of mobile phones to, to do this. So you have 60 frames per second, so you'll be seeing 60 frames per second. That's a lot of frames. That's, that's probably why you can notice that these are just a bunch of static frames that are going quick succession because they just they are just a lot of them so it looks very smooth so that's flutter and animation so flutter is built for that because it has full control of its build function it can call its build for function multiple times in a second so that that's one of the um ways flutter is so so awesome with animations um so we are going to be focusing on code-based animation explicit and implicit animation um in this talk um so Code-based animation can be divided into two categories, implicit and explicit animations. And implicit animations are animations performed implicitly. I've explained this with implicit animated widgets. Uh, they are animated, there are versions of inbuilt material computational flutter widgets. Examples are animated container, animated position, and this animated version is also provided as inbuilt flutter widgets. So um, if you need to use any of the animated versions of um, um, the, the the widgets you currently use, you just you can just type animated, and if you have um, suggestion enabled in your IDE, it can bring a number of suggestions for you. And uh, you can even say you are looking for maybe you are using opacity widget for example. You can just put animated and put opacity. You most likely get the, the suggestion for that. You can enter into the um, what's it called the class if you if your ID is enabled for that and see how it's implemented. So you know, that's one of the awesome things about Flutter. Everything is written in that, so you can enter the code of the widgets you are using to understand what they are doing. It's well documented. They'll tell you there are examples there, so you can even just copy the example and just use it. There are examples given there that you can um, use to understand exactly what each of the parameters you need to pass in are doing. So that's why we won't be focusing much on implicit animations here. Um, we'll be um, focusing on, on explicit animations, right? So the, we'll be focusing on explicit animation because th that's one of the best ways to understand animations, actually. So that, that's, that's the entry point to actually understand what goes around on that deal because at the end of the day, the implicitly admitted widgets that the Flutter team provides to us, the, that the Flutter that the pro, um, framework pro, provides to us is on that on that view they're still using an explicit animation to to do whatever um you want to do so um an example of an implicit animation here yeah, i've shown this uh this is from that part the um the animated align and animated container um stuff that just switches in between so that's basically um implicit um so let's go to explicit animations so um for explicit animations before we jump in fully there are some things that i want you to understand um the most important components that you need um so you need animation class you need the animation controller class uh sometimes you might not need the animation class you can just use the animation controller instead but most times when you are doing something complex you most likely need the animation class the animation controller class um Ticker provider mixing or single ticker provider mixing. If you are just um, using one, um, you just need this to <clears throat> around one controller. So um, 
Other important components that you might need um, are twins, um, curved animation, um, and then the important component for custom explicit animations. So um, I mentioned this earlier, there are two types of explicit animations you, could, you can go with. You can have a custom explicit animation and you can have uh, use go through the input um, explicit animation. Um, if you are doing custom explicit animation, use animated data or animated widgets. Um, so let's go to the next page. So the animation class, um, starting point, the animation class is not actually the widget that just the animation effect on the screen. The animation class is a listenable that exposes a different value throughout its lifetime to, from a start value to an end value. It works in tandem with the build function to create an animation effect. So um, this might seem this this might seem weird, but like when you add the name animation and if when you try to use it in the code, you might think, okay, maybe this is actually the, the class that is doing everything under the hood that is animating my widget that is causing that ball to bounce, that is causing that circle to rotate. Uh, but no, that's not what that's not what the animation class does. The animation class just emits value from a start value to an end value, basically. It emits different value across its lifetime. Um, um, for example, animation controller, for example, is um, an animation in itself. I will explain that further. It's an animation in itself. It extends um, animation double, and it has a begin, a default begin value of 0, 0.0 and final value of 1.0. So when the animation starts, when you start the animation, what the animation controller, which is an animation in itself, emits is the, its value between 0, 0.0 to 1.0. So he emits that throughout its lifetime. And I will explain how that lifetime is constructed, uh, how long the lifetime takes. Um, these are all based on the parameters you put in. But it's very important that first we understand that um, the animation class is not the class involved, like um, it's not the class performing the animation basically. It just emits value and then notifies the build function when the, when the value is emitted. There's, there are ways of doing this, multiple ways of doing this. Uh, you can use set state immediately. So you, so you have, for example, um, I'm going to show this in the next slide as a code. For example, you have an animation controller that emits a value, and then you can listen on the animation controller, and then immediately a value is emitted. Each time a value is emitted, you set state. Set state will rebuild, we call the build function. So the value has been created, then the build function gets called, and and then you go forward with that. So, so it works in tandem with the build function to create the animation effect. The animation class itself just emits value. Um, so this is an example of, I don't know if you can see my screen properly. Uh, that might be too, that might be too, um, maybe not very clear. Uh, let me see, is there a way we can do this? Uh, there's no way to do that. Um, so let me go back. There's no way to do that. All right. So what this, if you can see this, I'm not sure if anybody can see this, but if you can see this, what this do is basically, this is a basic anima animation example. Um, you have a controller, which I mentioned earlier is basically an animation in itself, right? So the controller extends the animation class um, so that it itself can emit value, right? So we have an animation um, controller. The animation controller by default has a start value of 0, 0.0 and end value of 1.0. So um, this animation controller emits a value um, every between that 0, 0.0 to um, 1.0. Now, when you are initializing the controller, um, right, uh, so when you are initializing the controller, uh, sorry, can you see that? Uh, okay. Uh, looks like uh, we can't animate this. Uh, we can't increase the size for this, which is, um, I think what you can do is that you could try yeah. and zoom and scroll. You can zoom and, and scroll through each of the code. Yeah, I can't zoom. That's a problem. 
thousand unless I uh, maybe maybe just explain the concept. Yeah, let me leave. and then maybe at the at the end space. you can put the slide. Okay. Uh um uh, uh this is even doing the reverse. Okay. Is it any better? No, it's not. So it's not uh, any better. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess I will just share the screen. Uh, okay. I'll I'll share this later. On. Uh, I'll share this later. On. Okay. Let me explain this. We might even get to a page where this is explained better. But basically, um, yeah, the basic everything here in short is the animation controller emits a value and then you use set state to rebuild every time the value is emitted and then that value is reflected because we are using the value in a text widget inside the build function so immediately the value changes right the animation controller notifies the build function through set state and then the state will be called and the value will be shown so um so initializing the controller. So there's going to be a snippet. This this snippet here, um, the okay that was in the previous. I think this can be seen. This is big enough. Yeah. So this snippet, um, we're going to be explaining it. So the animation controller, as I mentioned earlier, is an animation. But one of its major um, work is to control the animation. So to initialize it, you pass in two things: a vsync and the duration. Now, what's a vsync? Now, um, when you when you when you are initiating um, a, a state object that uses an animation, you pass in um, one of the important stuff that I mentioned earlier, which is a single ticker provider mixing or a ticker provider mixing. So that single ticker provider mixing or ticker provider mixing um, gives you a way, um, sort of find a way to inject the refresh rate of the device you are running on into the the animation controller so it lets the animation controller knows that uh, the refresh rate your device is running on say your device is running on 60 frames per second for example um that's what most devices run on but there, there are some 90 frames per second devices nowadays and 120 frames but most devices run on 60 frames per second so what this v-sync will tell the controller is that see the device this person is using runs 60 frames per second, right? So what we are gonna be using for this animation is 60 frames, it's gonna be a 60 frames per second animation. And then the second important parameter you need to pass in is the duration. So what's the duration that I want this to run for one cycle? So because you can have multiple cycles, if you reverse or repeat, right? But for one cycle, when the first runs, how many, how many what's the duration? Here, we are passing in one second. Now. There's an implication for both of these things, and I will explain this implication. Now, what this means is that for one cycle, right, for one cycle of an animation, for, for one cycle of this animation in particular, it's going to emit values 60 times one times. So it's going to emit 60 values in one second. So it's going to call the build function 60 times in one second, right, to, to, to build that. Now, if the duration we pass into this thing is two seconds, um, it's going to emit 60 times two, right? It's going to emit 60 times two frames in one cycle, right? Which is gonna be in two seconds, of course. So it's going to emit 60 times two. That's if your frame, if the um, refresh rate of your device is 60 frames per second. If the refresh rate of your device is 90 frames per second, um, for one second, it's going to emit 90 values in one cycle, which is going to be one second. And it's going to emit 90 times two values in two seconds, right? Which is going to be one cycle. So if you repeat it, right, it's going to just keep emitting it across the different side but for one circle in one second with a 60 frames per second um refresh rate is going to emit 60 values so based on the code we have here it will call the set state 60 times in one second so the set state calls the build and then it, it, it rebuilds 
So, um, so there's a link to the code that is a basic animation just for explanation. Um, so now a little bit extra. Uh, so here yeah, we are using this an um, explicit animation. Um, it, I call it rocking ball. And what we are basically doing here, um, like I've explained this, but just to go deeper and you see the code. So we have the state objects mixed in with the single ticker provider state mixing. Like I explained earlier, what this does is to notify the animation controller the refresh rate of the device. So if you have 60 frames per second device, that is what we pass to the controller. It will notify that, okay, yeah, this, so this is very important because you need that for the animation controller to be um, initiated. So um, this build ball container is basically what builds the, the circular ball you are seeing. So um, you have um, this, you are gonna be, you are gonna be using an offset for this. So um, let, me, let me talk about this animation object. I've not talked about that. So here, you know, in the previous example, we did not actually initialize this animation um, um, stuff. We did not, we only use an animation controller. But in this case, we needed this because we are not just animating a, a, a double value. We are animating offsets. So now you can animate. You can animate multiple things, especially um, stuff that has already been in the framework. That can so you can animate color. You can animate offsets. You can animate position. Um, so all those stuffs can be animated. Here we are focusing on offset, right? So that's why this animation offset is created. Now. When in the init state, that's where you initialize everything, of course. So um, the controller is initialized uh, with a vsync, notifying it of the refresh rate and the duration which is going to be two seconds for one cycle. And then the animation, because now we are not just animating between 0, 0.0 to 1.0, we are animating, we want to animate between a, a begin offset and an end offset. So one of the ways of doing that is using twin, right? So a twin is an animatable. It's not an animation itself, so it's an animatable. So um, what it basically does is it gives you a range of value that you can pass, you can start and end with, basically, like in the basic way to understand it. So you have begin, you have end. So um, offsets, half screen, um, you start, this is the begin offsets, and then this is the end offset. So the begin offset is basically from positive to negative. So we are doing from one end of the screen to another end of the screen. So the begin is the one end, the end is another end. So then to turn it to animation, you animate it because an animatable. And what you are, we are, and we are sort of, um, we are trying to create an animation, not an animatable. But you can use an animatable to create an animation. So the animatable is the twin. And to use it to create an animation, you call the dot animate on it, right? So the dot animate, you can just leave it like that. But if you want it to have special effects on how it start and finish, you use curved animation. So what, what curved animation basically does is it sort of animates the, the way it starts or like it's, you can do it much more, but majorly like, it, so it creates a curve, like a quadratic curve and multiplies it with the value that you normally would get from begin to end. So that sort of gives it, uh, maybe it should be fast when it starts and slow when it ends. That sort of situation, it should bounce or, so use a curved animation for that. You don't necessarily need to put this, you don't necessarily need to add this, but if you want maybe a special effect, you add that. So that, that, that's why this curved animation is added as an optional um, component for an explicit animation. So you have that and that you've, you've initialized both your controller and your animation. Now you can add the status listener. This is not, this is not compulsory. Um, this can be done in, a, in an easier way where you just repeat the animation controller. But I'm adding this just as an example. Um, yeah, so you can have a status which when it's completed, reverse it. That's why this is going like that. Uh, when it started, when it started this, the default uh, animation status is dismissed, then start it. Then you have to start it at first, um, and then you go with that, basically. So okay. that, that's amazing work. Uh, yeah. Amazing work. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing. Uh, I believe yeah. that we would also include the link to this code pen in your slide so that uh, 
the attendees can see the way you did your code and then can take inspiration from there, right? Yes, yes, yes. There, so I've got, yeah, I've got a few quick questions for you, yeah, from the okay. audience that you are already out of time. So just take three minutes to quickly answer some questions and then we'll go to the next speaker. All right. All right. So the first question from Tayo Olakunle is asking, which animation can he use that won't allow him to use a click to trigger the anim animation, uh, like something on a splash screen and a container that would animate without clicking on anything? Yeah, OK. Uh on a splash screen. So now this depends on what exactly you want to do, basically. Um, now, is the animation, like I mentioned earlier, is it draw-based animation? Is it um, just normal? If it's an animation like this, you don't need to click on anything to start it, right? Um, I didn't click on anything to start this animation. Immediately this loads, um, the animation started. So um, this is more, this is more um, on the, uh, where you, you program out, you, you have to programmatically do it. Um, this is more on that side than it is on the animation side. So you create your animation class and maybe in your init states, you call the animation to run on post frame callback. Um, so you add a post frame callback. So when the, the widget is done building, starts the animation, right? In the init state of your splash screen, for example, you can do that. You add a post frame callback. Um, so that you allow the build function to um, finish building before that um, gets called. And immediately you don't need to click on anything for that to show. So that, that is an example. And like I mentioned I earlier, have... if it's a drawing based animation, you most likely need to use something like Rive or Loti. And if it's a simple animation like this bouncing ball, for example, you, you write your maybe explicit or implicit animation. And then in your any state, as you want it to be called in splash screen, immediately you enter your any state, add the post frame callback, and then call that animation to, to start, basically. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I also think that you could also use animated builder. So final question uh, before I let you go. Uh, Solomon is asking, uh, though, how does animation affect performance? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it doesn't, it do, it's, animations like um they don't affect your performance if you write it properly basically but you can write it wrongly right the, like the the first example i gave around custom painter using custom painter with animations to create like uh, animations that sort of looks like um flare based drive based animation that can easily go wrong in the way you compose your widgets basically uh you might compose your widget wrong in the wrong way that um, maybe you are using opacity up in your widget tree that has a lot of children um, and in, in the topmost um, tree of that, that can affect your animation. It will cause a lot of drop frame. And let's say worse, you are even animating the opacity. So it's going from, um, it's showing the widget and then or showing the widget, that sort of situation, you can have a performance issue. So it's basically, Anything generally in Flutter um, that affects your performance is basically how you write your code because Flutter is built to be fast, normally without much optimization, right? It's built to be fast. So yeah, that's that's the that's the answer to that Thank question. You. Thank you very much, uh, Femi, for the amazing presentation uh, and the amazing session. Thank you for doing this. We would uh, you could also help answer some of the questions that other people have in the chat and then we would also try and we can also uh, at the end when all the sessions are done we can bring any unanswered question and then bring you back to answer them live thank you so much for doing this all right thank you thank you hi everyone that was Femi there talking to us about how to do animation and understand how it works in flutter up next, we'll be bring, I'll be having Jeremiah Obomo. Jeremiah is a software engineer at Mendix Technologies. Uh, he'll be talking to us about paint, layout, and its delicacies in Flutter. Jeremiah currently works uh, as a software engineer in the Rotterdam office 
of Mendix Technologies. Uh, Mendix is a leading innovator in the low code market. Uh, pro that provide tools for both personal enterprise and uh, task include but not limited to web and mobile technologies with JavaScript, TypeScript, and a whole lot of language. He has been writing Flutter since 2017, and I'm so excited to have Jeremiah here today. Uh, please uh, help me welcome Jeremiah. Hi, Jeremiah. Great to have you Hello. here today. Um, it's amazing to actually be here this morning, and it's something I've been looking forward to for a very long time. So, yeah. Let's get started. So you've been writing Flutter since 2017. How has your experience been like? Well, the experience has been mostly beautiful. Um, it, I, I actually cannot quantify it because before Flutter, I was working with a couple of tools that I am not going to mention, but made my life almost a living hell most times. And just picking up Flutter has just changed my entire mindset about building softwares. And I'm glad I'm able to share it today. OK. Uh, I don't know the audio is out. Can I start? Awesome, amazing. Uh, you are breaking a little bit, so you could want to uh, take a minute to quickly check your internet connection and to be sure that it's a stop uh, speed. Uh, but we are so excited to have you today to talk to us about paint, layout, and its delicacies. So you are up for the next 30 minutes. OK, um, that's good. So first off, it's going to be interesting, trust me, or believe me to an extent. Um, paint layout and its delicacies. Um, I am Jeremiah Obomo, and you can find me on most social media networks um, at Jobomb's Twitter and GitHub and CodePaint as well. So who am I first off? I am a Nigerian. I was born in Lagos. I studied engineering at the University of Benin. I used to work in Lagos. And a couple of years, a year back, I joined Mendix. And I do JavaScript during the day. and that and flutter during the night um I also, i'm also an open source enthusiast i love open source and you could find me on github i think it speaks for itself and i i just love flutter as you can tell i love that as well and over the couple of years i think two years now or three i've been able to work on a couple of medium to small and sometimes just personal projects and over the course of that period, I've had to use render objects. And it's something that has a bit of lacking in terms of understanding. And it's something that took me a while to actually get or wrap my head around. And I think it's something that a lot of people also experience and shy away from. But that should not be the case. And anybody should be able to learn it. And anybody should be able to move forward and build beautiful things with it. So that's going to be the topic of today. And I'll try my best to actually, to an extent, make sure you come out of this with, with something good and with passion to actually build beautiful things going forward. So this is the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about rendering. I'm going to talk about the how. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the why. I'm also going to talk about widgets, things that we already know, um, what widgets, who, which widgets does what. I'll also spend some time in render objects, especially the render box protocol. And then I have a demo um, on a very trivial example. And if time permits, I'll just go through a couple of worthy mentions at the end of the talk. So let's get right into it. First off, a very big disclaimer. You may not ever, like seriously, you may not ever need any of this. There's a bot at the end, but seriously, you may not really ever need any of this. And you might be like, why then? Why are we having this talk? Uh, it's quite simple uh, because first off, the Florida team has actually made sure that you do not need to go low level. In most cases, you have all the widgets you need, very high level. 
you could make a slider, you could you could use a calendar, you could call the date picker. Everything is just there for you with very high fidelity. Look at the material library and look at the Cupertino library. It speaks for itself. And secondly, you may not need any of this because it is truthfully difficult to write. It is difficult to maintain, well, to an extent, but it's simple. It's actually simple to wrap your head around. It's very simple to understand the flow, how it works. But there's a lot of gotchas that you just have to know. You you need to know how things connect to each other if you're if you're going to be able to use it. And that that's basically just it. And sometimes in order to do it, you you do need someone to actually hold your hand and tell you, oh, this is how it is. And I know most people do not like that. Someone directing you, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. So those are the reasons why, excuse me, you may not need any of this. But there's the bots now. The bots, I'm going to start with this. You have this beautiful slider. It's very simple, very straightforward. It's vertical. You just slide up. You see the battery going up. You slide down. You see the battery going down. And you're, you're like, how do I do this? Now, as a Flutter dev, these are designers that, these are things we see from designers that we call designers from hell because they just want to make you do stuff. They want to make you rack your brain. They want to make you think about things. And you as a dev you necessarily do not want to. So in most cases, you just want to use the widgets that are already available. But what do you do? Do you tell the client or do you tell the project owner that, ah, we cannot do this thing? And why don't you just use the material slider instead? It's, it's horizontal, but yeah. Well, not really, you shouldn't be doing that. And that's this is one of the reasons, I think this is the only reason I could tell you as to why this thing is important. Not everybody has to do it, not everybody has to know it, but I, I would say everybody needs to know that it's there and everything is doable. Literally everything is doable. And um, that's basically it. And secondly, if you think about it, if you really want to think about it and you do not want to go low level, I know you might be thinking, yeah, but this thing can already be done with widgets. I can see a rectangle, it has gradients. You could add the container with a butter, with a decoration of the gradients. And I could see icons, I could see circles. I think I could do this with a stack. I think I could do this with a container. I think I could do this with a couple of icon buttons and maybe a gesture detector. Well, maybe you can. And truthfully, maybe you actually can. But then again, I'm sure that I, when you look at what you did with the combination of widgets, your your mind will tell you, or let me say, there's an inner voice that will let you understand that this thing might not be too performant because all you see here right now, it's basically just a widget. Sorry, it's basically just a widget. Okay, why am I not playing? It's basically just a widget. All the, the interactions you see, the icons, everything is just a widget. There is no assets used at all. So that tells you, like, there's, there's, a limit, there's no limit you can actually go to. You could design your own icons if you want and all your interactions if you want. So there's a code pen to this, and you could check it out after the talk. We have limited time, so I'm not going to dive into the code of how it actually works. But it's a very simple code. I think it's about 200 lines, and a lot of it can be actually be removed. So this is my only reason, and I think I dropped two reasons. But these are the reasons why I would say it, it does it's it's the kind of knowledge that you do need to have you do do need to have you need to be able to customize things otherwise why are you using the ui framework so let's let's look at this this is something that literally every one of us has seen at some point so you must have gone through the flutter documentation i do not want to believe you just head flutter and jump straight into code and started coding maybe you did but if you didn't if you did that then this you're seeing this for the first time so I'm going to run through it very, very quickly. There's a source there, and you could actually see what it is. You have the engine. The engine is mostly written in C++, and it exposes a library called Dart UI. And from Dart UI, you could literally build anything you want, everything you want. But you do not want to do this because it might just be madness. Like too many mathematics, you have to track things that are changing, you have to track variables that are changing, you have to track properties that are changing, and you literally have to do the manual things yourself. So you do not want to do that, trust me. Now there's a, there's a separate level which encompasses everything about the framework. We have the rendering, and this is what we'll be talking about today mostly. And this is more or less an easier way to reason about things. 
you still have to track things by yourself. You still have to do mathematics by yourself, but you could already start composing things. And it's a bit composable at this level, but you still have to do some things implicitly by actually just updating and re remembering to actually update values that change. Now, it can get cumbersome really quick because you have to remember things. You have to know where things change. You have to understand that there's a flow and there's a pattern. And But the benefit of this is that you have full control over the layout. You have full control over the painting. You have full control over performances. And you could tweak things to the very, very minute detail. So the next level is the widgets. Everybody knows what the widgets are. You have the Sykes box. You have the container. You have several kinds of widgets. It's basically. In, in easy terms, it's configurations for your UI, for your render object. So every widget has an accompanying render object. And just so you do not have to do all that manual work yourself, the Flutter team has gone ahead of you and just written widgets that basically do the manual tracking of sizes, of painting, and handle everything under the hood for you. So everybody knows what the widgets are. It's basically just configurations for your render objects. Now, if we move a step further, I'm not going to talk about this because everybody knows what is inside the material and what is inside Cupertino libraries. And at that point, you could already start building your apps. So I'm going to skip that. And this is the rendering pipeline. It starts from user input animation. It builds, it checks the layout, lays out the, the widget or the render object, and then moves into painting and compositing and rasterizing. Now, we're not going to go into all of it. Trust me, there are very, very, very informed talks about this that you could actually use to understand, uh, mostly from Adam Bart and Ian Hixie. And you could find it on YouTube, and I already dropped the link at the end of the talk. So I'm not going to dive into all the technical mumbo jumbo. And I'm just going to focus on layout and paint. Now we're going to move on. Um, like I said, this is the engine part, the C++ and Dart. It's basically just bindings in, C in Dart for the C++ actual implementation. I'm not going to spend time on this. And so we go into the thesis of why this whole thing exists, the whole Flutter system, how it works, and how it combines together. Now. It simplifies into these three things. And like I said, I'm not going to dive into the technical parts of it. And I'm sure you could find information on these things other, other than this talk. So I'm just going to explain in very high level what happens. So the first thesis I'm going to talk about is the one pass layout and painting. So basically what this means is um, Flutter does, the framework does a one pass depth first into the, the very, from the very top widget to the very last widget and then goes back off. Simple, that's just it. Now it does this for layouting and it also does this for painting. So it goes into the widget tree and goes back up and that's it, no multiple switching and checking and mutation and all that. And then we also have simple constraints. This this was a very easy way to actually lay things out. Um, for render box, which we will talk about, you have mean height, uh, you have max height, you have mean width and you have max width. And the team decided that with these four properties, you could literally do anything. You could literally get any kind of information you need to build or lay out a widget or a render object on the screen. So it's very simple, very easy to wrap your head around. Just four things, and you know everything about constraints. There are two kinds of constraints. There's the box constraint and the sliver constraint. And you could already guess where it points to. You have slivers, and then you have normal boxes. And the thought. The third one is structural repainting and compositing. I'm not going to go deep into this. So it's basically just how does it optimize things? How does it know when to repaint? How does it stop things from repainting that do not need to repaint? How does it compose things and make sure that only the layers that need drawing actually get drawn and only the layers that need layout and actually get all that stuff? So I'm not going to go into this, but one thing I, I would like you to note about this is this is where the repaint boundary comes in. And it's a very it's a very small widget that most people do not know about. People literally don't even talk about. And I would just like you to check up on that. But we do not have so much time, so I'm going to move on quickly. Uh, this is me trying to explain in simple terms what the one-pass approach is. So for during this during the layout phase, I don't know if I mentioned, but Flutter actually decided, the team actually decided to split layout in and painting into two different phases so that you could actually optimize things very, very well in the sense that there are some things, there are some times you do not necessarily want to calculate what 
or where or how a widget should be positioned. In some cases, you have a red box and you ju just want to change the color of the red box from red to yellow. You do not want to have to calculate the sizes of the box or the, the siblings around it. You just need to change the color. So it saves you time and it saves, of course, stress on your machine to actually just paint and forget about laying out. So that's why this is actually divided into two phases. And it's very important to know this. So for layouting, like I said, the one pass approach goes from the top to the bottom. While it's doing that, it passes these constraints, the things I already talked about, about the min width, the max width, the min height, and the max height. And it passes these constraints down. Now, it's left for this render objects to decide from those constraints, like I said, what their sizes would be. So from the constraints, I know I'm supposed to be between 0 and 10 in width. I could decide what I have to be within that scope. Now, if I choose to go above it, then you see the red lines with the um, overflow 4px thing that everybody must have seen by now. So this is when you decide how big or how small you want to be using these constraints. So when you the constraints go downwards, the sizes go upwards. So it's very important to know because it's one pass. Now for painting, um, the offsets for the children or for the child, whatever case it is, goes downwards the tree. So every child knows, oh, this is the offset that my parents gives me. I know exactly where to put myself now. So it's important to know that. And then the offset, the child tells information, gives information back to the parents and saying, oh, I just painted myself. This is where you should paint the next thing. So it's important to know that one widget, one, one render object can actually be painted on different layers because the offsets go down, and then the next layer to be painted goes back up. Also very subtle and very nice to know. Now, this one, I'm sure a lot of us would have seen already. Uh, I'll just try to walk through it. It's the relationship between widgets, elements, and render objects. So just by looking at this diagram, you have a rect widget, and you have a cycle widget. You also have two elements. We don't know the name for now. And we also have a render rect and a render cycle. Now, on the left-hand side is the widgets, the normal widgets, you know, the widgets you compose, you put one into the other. And then on the right-hand side, you have the render object implementation. And then in the middle of it, you have the element. This is basically what glues both sides of both worlds together. Now, the element has an instance of the widgets. It knows what widgets it needs to build. The widget also knows what elements it uses because this is where the build context comes in. So your build context is basically saying, this is the element that, yeah, this is my element. This is the guy that handles all my relationship with the render object. So that's why from the build context, you could get things up the tree or down the trees. And the elements basically just orchestrates how, how and when things get created and or updated. Um, I would have loved to dive deep or deeper into this, but yeah, I'm using the word time as an excuse here, but it is very important to know these things when you are going this route. Uh, we know examples of widgets. We have size box, we have container. We may not know examples of elements yet, but there are several. And I made a note about this because I know I may not have enough time. So I'm also going to share the notes afterwards. So the notes is also going to help to an extent understand things that maybe is not understandable properly on the documentation. So. That leads me to render boxes. Now, how did we get to render box? Okay, we were talking about render objects, right? Uh, render objects, there are several variants of it, but there are two major ones that you probably need to know. You have the render box and you have the render sliver. Now, the render sliver, I'm not going to go into it too much because it's a bit, eh, in quotes, difficult to understand. So I'm going to focus on the render box because everybody interacts with this every day. And it's it's a lot easier to actually wrap your head around. So when I think about the render box, these are basically the things I think about. These are the things that come to my mind first. The constraint, like I said, come from the top. So the child or the render box knows where exactly to size or how exactly to size itself. The parent data, I did not mention because uh, like I said, the layout and the painting happens in two different phases. So the easiest way for me to explain this is when you're actually painting a child. Now, or when you're actually laying out the child, you're giving the child the sizes for it to use. Now, during painting, the child does not know some things anymore because it's two different phases. So I look at the parent data as a means to actually persist information, lay out information 
between the layout phase and the painting phase. So you could keep thinking there, like, where do I want this child to be placed in the tree? Like, I want to give this child its own offset. And I can calculate this during laying out, but I need this information also during painting. So you create a parent data and you put it in there during layout. And then after layout, you could get this information back. And I have a quick example about it. I'm also looking at the time. And then the next thing I always have in mind is layout because perform layout. This is where all the layout happens. It's a method you extend and you could do your calculations. You have access to your constraints at that point. And at this point, you also need to set the size, which is the fourth item on the menu. And when you set the size, that's pretty much all you have to do for this very simple minimal case. And then the next thing you have to know is your paint. Now, what do you do in your paint? You have access to the canvas, which exists in the context that you get back in the paint method. And you also have the offset of where the parent is relative to you. So you could decide where else you want to offset yourself to. It's all up to you. At this point, you have full control over everything. And then the next two, uh, Mac needs paint and Mac needs layout. So you're basically marking this render object as dirty for painting. So next time you're going, it's going through that phase, it will just repaint itself. If you don't do this, no paint happens. Your paint method doesn't get called. And Mac needs layout is basically saying, I'm marking this render object for layout the next time there's a new frame that is requested. And so when you mark this thing as needing layout, the next time there's a there's a layout phase, it doesn't skip it, and then it does all your calculation again. So it's something you should keep in note. These two things, very important. You might be making things up and you're like, wait, nothing is changing, nothing is happening. It's probably because you're forgetting to actually do this, either of these two, and these things you do when you change any of the properties that needs relayouting or repainting. Uh, so interesting we actually got to like the <laughs> almost close to the end and we still have a lot of time to spare so maybe i'll explain this in a little bit more detail so this is a very trivial very like i'm going to i'm going to say it it's a very 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 trivial example and normally i would not expect this to end up in your actual app because yeah why would you need a scented colored box you, like I said, Flutter has actually done an amazing job. The team behind Flutter have already done an amazing job to make sure that literally everything you need when it comes to building your UI is already available. So you want to color your box, you could use a decorator widget and you could pass it a decorator with or decoration with the color. If you also do not like that, you could use a container, very simple, create a container, give it a color. It's also another way to do a colored box. You could just write it, wrap a material around the widget and give it a color. So why else would you want to create your own colored box? Well, in this case, a scented colored box, because you could also color the box and then wrap a center around it. Uh, truthfully, there shouldn't be any reason for this, uh, but let's just say you want to, for the sake of learning, that's basically why we're doing this. So we are going to extend, first off, we are going to extend a render object widget. Now, this is a variant of the widgets. Now, uh, in the widgets, I, I didn't really talk much about the widgets, but maybe I'll just briefly mention. The widget is basically configurations for your elements and your render objects. Now, the widget is very cheap, very cheap. You could create any widget any how you like. If, it's, if, if the properties do not change, it just gets reused. It reuses the element and reuses the render object. So you don't, you don't really bother about those things. Uh, there are mainly four kinds of widgets. You have the mainly, you have the stateless widget, you have the uh, you have the stateless widget, you have the stateful widget, you have the proxy widget, which basically just acts as a proxy. It says, "Give me a child, and I will build the child. I don't care." Now you'll be wondering why why does that exist? Well, it exists because that's basically what the inherited widget extends from. So it has its use case. And then you have the render object widget. Now, those widgets basically serve as configurations for the elements, right? So that means in some cases, you do not really need an element or you do not care about those things or you do not want to create it yourself because there are several kinds of elements already existing. The stateless widget has its own stateless element. The stateful widget has its own stateful elements and all that. So there's a, there's a very neat widget that the, the team had to incorporate as well. That's the render object widgets. And these actually do not use 
a widget as a configuration, but allows you to actually use a render object as the configuration. Now, it's getting a bit muddy, so I'll try to stay true to this example at the end, but I just, I, I know I skipped that part, so I'm trying to actually go back to it. So the render object has two variants, like I mentioned, the render box and the render widget, the, the render silver, sliver rather. So, but in this case, we are going to use a single child render object so that we can actually give it our own render object that we're going to create ourselves because we want to be able to manage things ourselves. We want to be able to center things by our own calculation and we also want to color it the exact way that we want. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's one thing here that you just have to remember to do. It's the update render object. Now this, this callback, it's a very tricky one because you may not really know why it's there, but it's there for a reason. And there's one thing I noticed when I was still learning how this thing works is that the render object is actually mutable. It's mutable in the sense that you could change the property anytime you like, it's fine. Unlike the widgets, of course, which is very just immutable. You just create them anytime you like. The render object is mutable and you have to remember to change the properties that change. So if, for instance, I do not say render object dot color is equal to the new color, then my render object on the right hand side will have no idea that the color has changed. So I could not do anything with it. So it's it's just something to remember. It's something to take note of. It's very important and it's hard to debug. So you might just be doing things and you're like, nothing is happening. I already call magnet paint, but nothing happens. So just a quick point to know. So as you can see, the single child render object is very straightforward. You create it just like you create a normal widget. You give it its um, its properties and you create this render object and then you should know how to update the render object. Now the render object on the other hand, which you can see on the right, um, I extended from the render proxy box because it's, excuse me, it's easier to actually just show a simple example. There are a lot of things it does for you under the hood with a mixing that you do not need to bother about. So I'm just going to walk through it very quickly. Uh, in this case, I create a render object, a render box in this case, and I override the set of parent data. Remember the parent data I talked about where you could put information in and use them later during painting. So I created an instance of a box parent data because it's very straightforward. It just takes an offset because that's what I need in this case. Remember, I have to center the child of this widget in, I have to center the child widget. So um, this is a familiar pattern. You see the setter and getter. So like I said, the render object is mutable, which means you have full control over changing values whenever you like. So, but whenever the color changes, I want to do something else. So I want to be able to do other things programmatically. And this is where the setter and getter, which is used universally across most languages, it allows you to create a setter where you could carry out other actions when that value changes. So in this case, I check if the value actually matches the previous value that came in. And if it does, then I do not do anything because like I said, you have full control over everything you need to do. But if it's not the same, then I know the value has changed it. So I tell this render object to mark itself as dirty and needing painting. So during painting, it's going to check this function and be like, oh, this, this object is dirty, so we have to paint it again. And then the next thing is perform layout. So in this case, um, this is when I have to do my actual calculations and uh, apologies, this code is actually old. And I'm going to switch to the, uh, the example on that part. Uh, let's see. So, yes, I don't know if my screen is still visible, but this is where I'm at. And this is just the, the demo of what it does. And so, like I said, I am checking during the during perform layout, I make sure that the size of this widget is the biggest it can possibly take. So, like I said, the constraints pass from the top, you could do anything you like with it. So in this case, I use the getter method that says, give me the biggest values that I could get for this widget. So I use the biggest value to get this size, and that's why it's as big as you could see. I could choose to make it the smallest size and it should change. And sorry for the brief code. 
as you can see, is somewhere at the top. So you cannot see anything. So I'm going to go back to the weight loss. So I use the biggest size to make sure that it takes the biggest available size you can think of. And then I check if it has a child widget. Like I said, it's a single child render object widget. So if it has a child, then yeah, I want to do something with the child. I want to lay out the child in the middle of the screen. So I look at this child and I say, oh, use the, the minimum things you can think of from the parent. The parent says, use the biggest size. But now for the child, I wanted to use the most minimum thing that he could think of. We could play with this demo a little bit, but I'm not going to do that for time. So you could go to this link and just play with the parameters as much as you like, and you see how things react. So this is where I say, oh, now this is the parent data. I want to add values to it. So I want to center this widget, the child widget to the center, in the center of the screen. And so I use the helper method from the alignment class to get the center and find the offset along which it exists within its parent scope. Very simple stuff, very easy stuff. And then I save that in the offset. And during paint, I say, um, canvas, draw me a big rectangle that takes the entire size of the screen. And then give it a color that comes from the top, which is basically what you want your colored box to be. And then if it has a child, get that offset back for the child from the child parent from the child's parent data and then now paint the child paint the child using the offsets from the parent data and the offsets of this entire widget and straightforward you get to see something now how do you use it just like you would use a normal widget i created a scaffold and i give it my widget i give it a color and i give it a child hello world just so you know it's not a fluke i'm going to say helios world something and run so it's not a picture so back to the presentation you could play around with it it's a very simple very trivial and it's not something i would expect to see in your final app but it's something to play around with very simple and yeah there we are we managed to get the whole thing wrapped up quickly so i don't know if i still have as much time but i'm just going to mention some things that some widgets i built along the way that that are worth mentioning. So first off is a sliver colored box. Now it's pretty much very straightforward as well. And it's basically just telling you how you could also use the render sliver to make things yourself. Now in this situation, you might be like, why do you need a sliver colored box? You have a sliver, a sliver list, you want to give it a color, a specific color for its own case. I don't know if anyone must have gone through this, but I'm guessing you have. And this is just saying, yeah, even if it's a sliver, you could do things with it. Very simple, very straightforward. It's a long, big code, and it's worth looking at. And uh, I am guessing my time is up. Yeah, amazing. Uh, you can just just wrap through the widget, and then okay. uh, I mentioned. OK, OK. So uh, there, are other, there are like three other things here. This is an app, play, a widget that I sort of like came to understand about. And I love it because it's pretty much straightforward. But you look at something like this and you're like, how do you do it? it you just use a scaffold. Or I had a case where I needed to put a background image around a scaffold. And like, you have to make the scaffold transparent. But then how do you make the scaffold transparent Someone might be like, yeah, just use a stack. Put the, the app bound or put the widgets you want on there. Um, I don't know how else to explain this, but if you look at the code pen, you get what I'm saying. So in this case, I decided, why, why don't I just do a command click into scaffold and see what it does? And that led me down the path. And I realized that you could actually build something that looks like a scaffold yourself and give it a background image. And this is what I came up with. The link to the code pen is available. You can check it out. And finally, the neon graph. A couple of you must have seen this already. It's It was a weekend practice or a weekend experiment. And yeah, it, it was lovely. It looked beautiful. And I was happy. I was really impressed with myself. Yes. And um, yeah, you could check it out to see how it works. It's also not that complex, but it's beautiful. So just uh, the wrap up of all the widgets I mentioned about and some of them that I skipped. The, the the links point directly to their docs and you could see for yourself what they are and how they work and don't be scared about these things don't be scared of them they're just simple things that you could read and the documentation around this is beautiful 
trust me, you would benefit going into all these things. And then finally, if you still lack some information based on what I just said, these links would explain literally everything to you. Flutter internals, inside Flutter, beautiful stuff. You should check them out. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much for that amazing session. Uh, there's one question for you from Tayo. Uh, Tayo is asking, what is the best learning resource you could recommend for Renderbox implementation? Uh, for Renderbox implementation, I I think DDA Bowlens, I might be pronouncing the name very wrong, but I I saw one time he made a, he made an article about render boxes and it was beautiful. Now I've seen a lot of people write articles around building a custom thing. This is how you do it, just like I said, I just did with the center colored box, and that's mostly how far you would get. But then the true information is actually in the Flutter docs, like. You do not even have to go to Flutter Docs. Just a command click or a control click if you use Windows, and you would literally see stockpile of knowledge within the widgets. All you just have to do is pick one widget you really like, command click, command click, command click, command click, and trust me, you will end at the spots where you just see things being written out, all the mathematics, all the layout, and all the painting, just right there at your fingertips. Watch for that amazing session. I uh, will be taking a one minute break so we could grab water or coffee and then we'll be back with a session from with John Obi, who will be talking to us about thinking architecture in Flutter apps. Thank you so much, Jeremiah, for this amazing session. So guys, you're back, you're stuck here with me. Please do not forget to tweet your learning with the hashtag, hashtag Flutter Day, hashtag Flutter Day Meetups, and at Flutter Lagos. If you are not a member of our community, like to join the Flutter Lagos community, please do join with uh, bit.ly slash FL Telegram. I'll just, I'll display the, the URL on the, I'll display the URL on the screen now. So that is the link to join the community on Telegram. We are open. Yeah, we are open and everyone is welcome to share knowledge, to talk and then to learn stuff. Yeah, so I believe everyone is grabbing water. Uh, after John's session, we would be having a game on Slido to, uh, to adjust a fun game. Uh, the event code is 1960 uh, and it's on. So we're having a game on Slido, uh, and the event code is 1960. So much more detail. Wow. Immediately after John's session, you can join us on Slido.do for a quick quiz and then just have some fun. So, John. Yep. How are you doing today? I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Hi, John. Hi. Hey, man. I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Uh, I think you need to talk a little bit louder because your microphone, uh, I can hear you correctly. OK, how about now? Thank you. Is it better now?
Okay, I think it's good now. So, I, John, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Awesome. Okay, Jim. All right, so John will be talking to us about how to think architecture in Flutter apps. Uh, with John, John is uh, John is better known as John Goridim. That's what we call him. He's a mobile engineer at Ginger.io. Ginger is a healthcare delivery company focused on making emotional and healthcare available to those who need it when they need it. The mobile application. Uh, that facilitates the delivery of this care is what John and his team has been working on. Uh, interestingly, he also works at Andela. Uh, we all know Andela extends with tech talents from across Africa. Uh, his, his week is usually filled with code reviews, PRs, Q&As, uh, debugging, stand-up, demos, engineering meetings, you know, the life of a software engineer. <laughs> uh, he got started with Flutter because his job required him to, uh, at some point like last year, they needed to migrate uh, their hybrid database, uh, their co native code bases to a hybrid mobile SDK. And that is how he became a Flutter engineer. Uh, and then he has come to appreciate it for the reactive paradig parad paradigm that it has. And it makes building great and complex UI very easy. Uh, other than Flutter, he works with native Android and web technologies. And you can find him on social media with at John Gorithim, uh, which will be scrolling on the screen. So John, how has your experience been with Flutter over the past one year? Um, yeah. Um... It's been awesome. I don't. I don't think anyone could possibly say it otherwise. Uh, but yeah, everyone their own opinion. But for me, it's been a great one. Um, like you rightly said, um, it wasn't actually intentional that I got into Florida. Um, but yeah, it happened, and I've come to love it so much. Um, because if you come from a native um, mobile mobile development, you actually uh, get this kind of feeling. I'm guessing because Florida just simplifies a lot of things. And yeah, around native development, that's normally, if you were to do it using the native SDKs, uh, yeah, at times you feel like crying on a job. So, yeah, but Florida brought a lot of ease and, and that, that's sweet. I, I love it for the speech and I love it for the fact that I can create anything I can think of right on the screen. I can paint it right on the screen. Um, I love it for the fact that it started out with a, a reactive paradigm you know, bringing the, the kind of paradigm we have on the React into the, which is for the web, into into native development, and that that's really awesome. Yeah, that's has been my experience with it. Um, uh, yeah, so you. today I'm excited because we'll be talking about architecture and Flutter apps, and it's a particularly, inter it's a particularly interesting topic for me too, uh, because I really want to know how to think through some things before I start working on my Flutter app. So I'll just let you get started and let's have fun. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, OK, yeah. So a quick thing. Um, yeah, I'll be looking up. Uh, that's because um, my slides are right on the monitor right in, a little bit above my, my laptop. So yeah, so if you see me looking up like this, please don't get weird out. Uh, just me looking at the slides. And I do apologize if that doesn't look good to you. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so about me, I, I didn't know how to talk about myself. <laughs> yeah, and I just have to like just go to GitHub and um, grab my my overview and put it here. Um, yeah, I play. I'm not very active when it comes to uh, uh, open source, but yeah, I do a little bit of this, um, and I'm also always very interested in seeing what people are building that are cool and awesome and helping people out there. Um, yeah, uh, I'm a big man. Yeah, I'm actually a member of two big organizations, and yeah, that might be complicated to talk about. But just understand, it's actually an ease, and it's, it's been lovely being you know, um, a member of two big organizations at the same time. And of course, based on uh, how things run and how things go. Yeah, 
it's, it's been great. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's more like that about me. Uh, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so Think Architecture and Flutter app, that's what the topic is about. And so at some, at some point I, I, I was a bit confused about this topic because I, I know what I wanted to talk about, um, but, but if you, it feels like I didn't get the topic right. So I kind of like spent some time trying to <laughs> understand the topic myself and yeah, so that I can be able to um, uh, relate that to everyone. And so, yeah, at, later on it got to me that actually I just basically want to show people, um, show folks out there, uh, yeah, from my own experience, how I go about um, coming up with solutions, um, uh, building mobile apps while having architecture in mind. So in this demo, I'm going to be talking about, um, uh, okay, yeah, in this uh, talk, I'm going to be, I'm going to present a demo app built for this talk, um, talk a little bit about software architecture and why you should care. Yeah, for some persons, I don't, I don't care about that. Keep your details, especially when you're working on a political project. <laughs> you just want to skip up the skip the the rules and just get stuff out. Um, walk us through the architecture behind the demo app, and um, yeah, talk talk about what some of the architectural components of the app do or can do for you. Okay, let's talk about architecture. So. Uh, I just I, I kind of like grab this uh, these three definitions that kind of resonated with me. Um, so the first one says software architecture refers to the fundamental structures of a software system and the discipline of creating such uh, structures and systems. Right. So now one thing that I actually wanted to pay critical attention to uh, yeah, in this particular definition is. Yeah, the fundamental structures were the word that was mentioned there. So for every system, for every, um, so we can look at that on the mobile platform. There are some developments. You know, for every time, there are uh, things that, there are, there are fundamental structures that you need to leverage to be able to come up with software solutions. Um, yeah, in that on that platform. Uh, yeah, so. Each structure comprises software elements, uh, relations among them, and properties of both elements and relations. So this is actually very, very interesting, right? So, so the elements, right, I want you to, so we're gonna get to components later on, but I just want to, to give you a picture of what that could be. Uh, navigation in your mobile app is an element. Um, your services, the services that you bring into your app, they are also elements. Uh, other components around that. So how these things interact, uh, your views and your view models, how all these components and all these elements come together to uh, make what you want to do or help you bring out your solution is actually part of what uh, software architecture is all about. So software architecture serves as a blueprint uh, for a system. Yeah, just more like uh, the, the real life architects do, uh, or the ones that are built houses. So they kind of like create, create uh, a plan, which is a, a blueprint for a building. And that's actually more like what software architecture also refers to. Um, it provides an abstraction to manage a uh, complex system, uh, sorry, system complexity and establish a communication and coordination mechanism amongst components. So this is also pointing out the same thing that we, we, uh, we saw earlier in the first definition. Um, so yeah, the communication, and the coordination mechanism amongst these components is really, really critical to software architecture. Uh, oftentimes, people have to answer questions or whether they have to use uh, a microservice or whether they have to, um, yeah, have multiple databases and how you go about your data models in order to be able to uh, fully bring out your solution. So, yeah, so that abstraction and um, the complexities, right, and the communication and the coordination between the components uh, of the uh, yeah of your of your app of your software is also one uh, what we actually what we actually looking at in software uh, architecture. 
So the last one is actually the one that I'm really very passionate about, and for me it sounded like a warning. Uh, software architecture is about making fundamental structural choices that are costly to change once implemented. So if this decision that you have to make will actually cost you later on, uh, when you if you intend to change them, then you have to do it well. So that's actually what that is saying, that you have to plan it well. You have to um, just imagine if Facebook will have to change the architecture someday. Yeah. And what's how the cost it affected to it to have and everything that needs to go into that. Uh, yeah. So it's a very, very costly uh, change and you have to, when you want to do it, you have to do it well. So architectural components. Um, so these are the fundamental components of a system, uh, of a software system, uh, of a system in general. And the common ones in mobile are you have the local database, network service, uh, you have a view model, uh, view, definitely the UI. Um, navigation is a part of this. Uh, change notify is actually like an architectural component. There's actually a lot of them. Uh, streams and um, features that that provide actually, these are actually components that actually helps you uh, be able to come up with your idea um, yeah, be able to implement your solution. Exception handling is a part of this. Uh, there are a lot more. Uh, you can always look out for more on those. So why should I care about architecture? Well, I mean, why not just start writing my code and put out my idea out there and, and go to sleep, right? So why would you want to do this? Um, so easy to maintain. So maintainability is actually a very, very uh, critical uh, uh, point to consider um, when architecting. Um, because it, if, you, if you don't have that in mind when you start, in the long run, um, Yes, <laughs> you will have more costs to, to pay for that. You have a lot of uh, tech debt. I have had an experience with the code base that we have to complete the rights. That's because it has gotten to an extent. So yeah, that it can't receive any more contributions. So the code base uh, lived for 12 years and over 12 years, it got contributed to by a lot of engineers, many of whom are not even mobile engineers. They just know the language. It's a, the, the app is actually in Java, so it's a native Android app. So they just know Java and they just contribute, they just write anything. So there's a lot of spaghetti here and there, everything is, yeah, you get the point. <laughs> so it got to a point, the company needed to move faster than they are moving and it needed something that would allow them to move as fast as they want to move, be able to implement, implement our features faster and um, have that be in the hands of their users. And we needed to migrate. So we have to spend four months rewriting the entire code base in Florida. And yeah, it's been a great, uh, a great move for the company and for all of us too, that was insane. So maintainability is key. So easy to scale. So if you if you have a well-architected solution, uh, there's one thing I, I saw in one of the movies I once, uh, I once looked at and the code says, fashion never ends. And fashion never ends is actually in the context of tech that ideas never stop coming. So when you have an idea, uh, you think that's probably just what you need. But trust me, once you have that be out there and have people use it, new things and more things will keep coming into your head. Otherwise, you won't have anything like fashion in applications. WhatsApp is not what it is. Um, WhatsApp 10 years ago, oh, sorry, when it started, is not what it is now. And Facebook, when it started, is not what it is now. So there are new features always coming in from time to time. And so ideas always come in. So that, this is one of the reasons why you always have, you always have a well-architected or you may want to have a well-architected solution so that it will allow you to scale up down. If there's a feature in your app that people are not interested in, you can easily take it out and throw it away and focus more energy maintaining those ones that are people are using. Easy to test. Testability is actually very important. This may not see this one uh, may not seem like uh, something that uh, yeah a large number of us are interested in, <laughs> but yeah, it's very very important um, having a, the ability to write unit tests, uh, integration tests, essentially automated tests for your application is 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 is, is a great joy because 
um, other than the fact that you are testing out the logic of your application, when somebody changes something that breaks another thing, it is very easy to spot that out. And that's a very critical point. Um, yeah, and perhaps when you're doing your to-do app, you don't care about it, but when you get into those big companies that we all aspire to work for, this is critical. And some some code bases have over a million tests that runs for every build, every push. Yeah, um, software behavior uh, is predictable. So if you have a well-acted solution, your software uh, behavior, your app is a lot more predictable. So you can you can tell when something uh, you can tell what is causing this, or what is making this change, or what is moving the screen from here to here. So you are able to like understand when something happens. Uh, you're able to know what actually happened and be able to go there and fix it. So because there is a predefined character for your application, and if anything goes out of that point, it's easy to uh, manage and take care of. Minimal tech debt. Um, yeah, if you have a well-architected solution, you will have minimal tech debt over, uh, over time. Trust me, <laughs> that's how it is. Um, onboarding is faster and easier for new devs. Yeah, so if you have a well-structured application, it is easy for someone to get on board on the team and uh, yeah, and be able to quickly understand what is happening. So when you have it documented or drawn out on uh, the kind of flow chart that indicates how all the components of the application are interacting. So it's very easy uh, for a new dev to get on board and start contributing. And this may not seem like a big deal, uh, but really, for some companies that are moving at speed of light with their ideas, trust me, this is very important. It's very important that a dev gets into a team and start contributing in the next two days. I've actually got into, <laughs> I've actually gotten into one team like that, and I have to start contributing. But there was almost like no time for onboarding. Yeah, so provide a clear workflow structure for everyone on the team. So, yeah, if you have a well architected solution, um, everyone on the team have. Uh, is that we have the workflow structure and you have this a build of you and you're able to follow it. So when somebody decides to go out of it, you can easily spot that out on the PR and drop a review. And yeah, it gives the, the, the entire team a structure to move it. Okay, so cool parts. Just wanna uh, get us all pumped up about what we will actually be looking at in the demo app. We'll be looking at what is on there. Uh, how that was architected, but first let us see um, the UI of it. Okay. Um, so I have to I have to put the entire desktop on screen uh, so that. Okay. Uh, apparently, I've actually got I've onboarded and got into the application. Um, And by the way, I didn't do the demo dance, so just in case anything breaks on me, <laughs> I do hope you understand the demo dance. Okay, so it's actually a very simple application that um, what it's supposed to do for us, uh, it's uh, it displays uh, engineers. Um, yeah, for this actually software Java engineers in Nairobi, um, I actually wanted to change this to point at uh, um, maybe flood engineers in Nigeria or something. So maybe some of us can see our faces here. But yeah, I guess preparation took me a lot of time and probably forget to do that. Forgot to do that. So um, first, let me switch back to light mode. Uh, so essentially, what happens is uh, when you, this is actually connected to the GitHub API. The authentic authentication flow, actually, I think I want to walk us through the entire flow. Uh, they are going to pardon me because I'll be taking a few minutes out. Oh, I think I'll just go ahead with this um, so that we don't, we don't take so much time. Um, if you want to see the entire flow, that's from onboarding and getting into the application, uh, you can, yeah, I'll, def I'll definitely drop a link, uh, link to this repository, and you can just view it and test that out. Essentially, this app was built for this purpose for this uh, talk, and what it does is uh, it pulls out the users from GitHub API and displays that app here. And I can open any of these. 
see the full details. And I can favorite. I cannot favorite. Right? Let, if you check out the favorite tab, you see that nothing is here yet. And um, but if you go to my profile, I uh, assume this is my profile, this displays all the engineers or the geeks. I call it geek app all the geeks that have looked at their profile so that I can always um, check them out again if I'm interested. If you look at this counter here, um, it's, it's zero for now because I've not liked any of them. Um, we also have a button to toggle uh, between light and dark mode. And this is just displaying uh, my Firebase user account uh, email. <laughs> yeah, what a wonderful email we have there. So getting back to the home tab, the home tab essentially displays these uh, these engineers and so um just gonna open this so uh, the dancer codes uh, is happened to be once my uh my team lead in Andela so yeah is it is someone that I really appreciate for his guidance and all that I learned from him yeah so um this is a profile I can like, right? And then if I come to the, uh, the favorites uh, tab, and you can see that it is already appearing there. So this is a super reactive app. And when you go to my profile, you can see this counter has incremented, showing that I have one person that have likes now. And let's do a couple more of this. Uh, um, Okay, so I can like, right? And then, so aside this uh, uh, information or details about this uh, particular user, or uh, yeah, GitHub user, Geek, you can also try to share their profile. So this, on a, this is on a simulator, so on a real device, you actually get uh, more uh, viable options there. But video on GitHub is a, is a button I wouldn't want to tap on now because it's not implemented. Apologies for that. I will definitely add that in. Um, and, and also to mention that this, pro this project is going to be out there for learning uh, for anybody who want to get started uh, uh, with architecture. And I also added a lot of interesting UI components to it. So I uh, try with this tab navigator that we have here, the bottom tab navigator. Uh, I have to make, do all these tweaks here. And just so if you're interested in doing this kind of thing in your app, Usually, it's not. This is not like a, a usual way that you see tabs. Um, yeah, a bottom tab. Uh, but if you want to do something like this, you can also open the GitHub app. To so you can also run this app later on. Go to the repository and be able to grab some code there and do what you want to do. So it's a learning project. I'll be adding comments to it. Uh, every line of code, just to uh, clarify everything um, that is in there. Um, and also making the project better and it's also open to contribution i'm more than happy to receive contribution for, from uh, anyone who wants to contribute so that we can actually uh, yeah improve what it is and what it's supposed to do so now that i've liked uh i've favorited this uh, this gig if i go back to favorite just um yeah his profile is there already or a card is there for him and the counters incremented. So you see, there, there's a lot of reactivity going on here. And she's also one of the things I will be looking at later on. So I want to show us this app first so that everything I'll be talking about later on will actually uh, make sense. So right now we have a visual cue of what it's here. Uh, I want you to also notice something. This, this is a navigation. Um, if I open an engineer here, uh, the detail page appears behind the bottom navigation bar, right? Uh, but can you observe what happens when I open an engineer's page from the profile? So the bottom navigation is out of the way. And this is, uh, this is one of the things you may want to do. Uh, so when you have to, you see this in, in WhatsApp, when you want, when you tap on the camera button, it completely takes you out of the tab and puts you on, on the full screen mode. So this is one of the things you want to do often, jumping out from a tab level navigation 
into the main application left in navigation or yeah the other way around so the difference between this profile here the one that i just closed out and the one that is appearing here right behind the bottom navigation is because they are pushed on the, on two different um, levels of navigation stack right so this uh, this one is appearing on the navigation stack that is uh, like that's the home navigation stack tab navigation stack so if i if now i have this uh, back button here if i go back i'm back to the root screen and when i open it, uh, um, another profile yeah it's 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 appearing behind so it's a stack of navigation that's only connected to the home tab and we also have uh well for profile this i did something here i have to jump out completely from the tab navigation level navigation to a main application level uh, stack yeah the terms there but you get the point and i can also do the favorite writing thing and once i close this you can see the counters implemented so this is a super reactive app and if i come in here and switch to dark mode we have this beautiful dark mode for those of us that are so in love with dark mode apologies the bottom navigation navigation bar is not aware of uh, um, uh, dark mode or uh, color mode changes. Uh, yeah, definitely one of those things I'm gonna add later on to make this project better and make it uh, a great learning project for everyone. So you can see the entire application reflected the change. Um, you can see the home and um, yeah, Okay, so that is that on the on the app demo. So back to the slides. Hope that was interesting. We happy? Yeah, I guess we are happy. Okay, so how do I get started uh, thinking uh, uh, about architecture? Uh, how, how does that become uh, my way of thinking? And um, the next few slides uh, we'll be talking about that. So architectural thinking uh, is the point of intersection between the what, the how, and the why of a software solution. So when you come up with a solution, perhaps you want to build the next Uber. Hey, John. Okay. I can hear you. So before you go too far, Collins is asking, uh, what language do you, did you use for the backend? of the project okay I'm, I'm simply just consuming github api uh the public oh, okay. API. yeah okay yeah i can i i can make the link the, the necessary links available to us um at the end of the talk yeah thanks for that question and All also right. I'm, I'm, I'm also I'm, I'm also interfacing with uh with firebase authentication so i added that in so that um i i've, I've gotten this question a lot this question a lot about how to integrate firebase into your app so we just have those experiences. So if you have multiple services, you're, you're using a- The one final one before I let you get back to, to your architectural thinking, Israel is asking, uh, how was your team able to write tests for the project that you had to rewrite in four months? Okay, cool. Uh, interesting question. Uh, so we have that planned out. Um, it was part of our architectural, architectural planning at the beginning of the project when we are doing the, the infrastructure stuff that related to the application. So we have to like do a research on how we're going to be, um, uh, be testing the application. And there were, as of that time, there weren't uh, a lot of resources out there on how to um, go about uh, testing the Flutter, actually testing the Flutter app. So we decided to invest energy on testing the service layer and testing out the, the view models. Because yeah, the view models is where you have or the logic that control the screen and the service layer uh, that the service coordinator and the service layer components that connect to it are actually where we have all the service stuff, right? That under the hood does work that makes the project work. And we, we invest more energy on those. We didn't do so much of uh, UI uh, or what you call widget test uh, because yeah, we, we kind of look at, we kind of prioritized. Of course that has its own value uh, we, 
Right now, we have it on some screens, on some very complex screens. So where you, want, you may want to do that is on a tabbed view. So you want to verify that when you tap on each of those uh, bottom navigation items, uh, that you are actually switching to the drop to provide screen and other things around that. So yeah, that we have that planned out and it was part of our workflow. You must write test for your features. And it was really it, it was really tense then because aside also thinking about the, how you grab your features and implementing them as quick as possible because we have a very crazy deadline. And you are also uh, trying to make uh, decisions around. You're also trying to also pay attention to how you're going to test those. So right now we have a CI, <laughs> although we didn't have that there. So um, there, there were some of the tests that we actually kind of like uh, skipped. Uh, but immediately we finished the project, we went, um, while we are still in alpha test, we went back and make sure that all the tests are filled in. That's that on that. All right, thank you. So I'll just give you 10 minutes to quickly wrap up uh, the rest of architectural thinking and all that, and then we'll take it from there. Great. Uh, so yeah, I'll have to like, uh, go as quick as I can. I do hope you, uh, you are able to get as much information as you can. So architectural thinking is the point of intersection between the what, the how, and the why of a software solution. So this is just what you want to focus on whenever you're thinking architecture. Uh, the what, uh, the how, and the why. So what is the what? Let's... So also to mention, so what that actually means, uh, so put it in a, uh, make it a little bit literal. So when all this, uh, so these are more like question tags. And when you use this to ask questions around your project, and you're able to bring all of them to a, a point of consolation, um yeah that's actually where you have um architecture thinking that's that's actually that's the point where you're making architecture decisions so the what's require it basically it is basically the, the requirements sorry so this refers to the requirements and the constraints that we want to address in our software products so yeah do you want quality do you want it to be testable do you want it to be maintained do you want it to be scalable do you want a reactive app like I have? Do you want do you want it simple? Um, do you want it to have the ability to handle large data sets? Um, and then security and so on. And then there are trade-offs to this, the constraints, right? We have uh, a, a couple of those on the mobile platform about uh, the kind of things you can do on, in the background, the kind of things uh, and how long you can achieve on the background task. Um, we have constraints around uh, uh, permissions. We have uh, other constraints are around the, the development environment and around the requirements that we want to come up with. Uh, for example, if you want to interface with Bluetooth, and how does it, does the platform actually give you access to or give you the ability to consume the user's Bluetooth or hardware device or interact with our API? So those constraints and so this is actually the point where you identify those uh, the constraints, um, list out the requirements, and be able to kind of like prioritize and take out what needs to be taken taken out and then work with what you have. Uh, so the how is actually where the design comes in. So people, you get people talk about MPVM, uh, a bunch of patterns, you, have, you know, people talk about provider and block pattern and all these patterns, right? So, but the design, there's actually like patterns, but um, the design of the system um, is actually the, the how. How do you want to go about implementing all the requirements after addressing the requirements and the constraints. Uh, so the one thing to also note here that the design that you're coming up with or the pattern that you want to go with has to satisfy all the requirements of the hard question, right? So, great. So the why, so this essentially captures the decision, uh, the key decision being made in the how and, uh, and the what question. So if you notice what I'm talking about those two, I'm actually kind of like making references of uh, to what the, your decision could be like, what you're trying to think of, um, considering the constraints on the platform and also letting your those requirements and the constraints play a role in helping you uh, uh, choose the, the kind of pattern or the design pattern you want to go with. So the, that decision that is flowing around 
from the how and the what, and then from and then back and forth is, is actually where the why comes in. So why do you want to do this? So why do you want to go with this? Uh, M, uh, why do you want to go with this MVP pattern? Why do you want to go with this uh, design pattern? Or why do you want to go? Uh, uh, why would you want to use this? Uh, uh, or prefer this requirement over another? So all those decisions actually are what actually plays there. It's actually what the why is referring to. So the demo apps architecture. Uh, uh, so these are the things I, I, I put out as requirements. So we, it has to be reactive, it has uh, support for offline, and um, simple to understand architecture, testable, uh, easy to maintain. So uh, those are the requirements. And yeah, essentially answering the what question, what are you solving for? What do you want to build? So it's a very common question that we ask a lot uh, in my team. And whenever you come on standards and you're just blah, 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 blah. hey, come on, calm down. What are you solving for? So don't try to uh, get us all happy for no good reason. So what are you solving for? What is your, your thought process around what you want to do? Okay, so the app design pattern and implementation. Sorry, pattern implementations. Um, we have MVVM design pattern. That's actually what I choose. Uh, it's actually very common uh, in, in our Flutter community. And um, it's very common here. And then, um, of course, to be able to support offline, I have to pick a little bit of a DB. Uh, provider pattern for its reactive uh, uh, requirement. And then a repository pattern, you know, actually, which is going to help me to make the app easily testable. Uh, have a, a simple to understand architecture and easy to maintain architecture. So component one, so here is actually what we're going to be looking at, uh, the components of the application and how this actually interact with one another. So while we are talking, while, while I was defining the architecture at, uh, at the very beginning of this talk, uh, I know I, there were things I, I, I was kind of like get you to focus on. And one of them is actually the components of the system. Uh, the components of the application, right? The fundamental uh, structures, sort of, and the coordination and the communication uh, mechanism that exists between this, actually what is very, very key uh, in the architecture of thinking. So here we have the view, what you see that uh, um, essentially the screen, and then you click a button, for example, like favorite, and then it goes to the view model and trigger uh, a method, and that method uh, the view model triggers an action on the service uh, layer, which I call the repository, repository here. Uh, well, I, I, in, in the application, you see the service API. That's actually a pattern that is very common in the mobile uh, community, known as the repository pattern. So having a layer that coordinates between all the services you have in the application, um, this actually comes very handy to make the app easy to test and also um, make it easy to maintain. And if you're talking about decoupling the components, this is actually a very good way to do it. So I have the server, which is the GitHub API, and I, the service layer actually knows where to go. So when you send in a uh, request or trigger an action, the service API knows where to go and get it, whether it's to go to DB and get that data and come back, or whether to go to uh, the plugin, the, the share plugin in the app, uh, perhaps you send, oh, I want to share it. There's some content, here's some data, and then it goes to the native uh, plugin, which I, I believe definitely have some platform connections, and that will go to the native uh, platform and then trigger some intent there that you want to share something. So the service API handles that, uh, uh, that mechanism, that flow of communication and coordination amongst all the services that exist. So this is the uh, first pattern that you will see. Um, so here, there's a direct, uh, for example, I'm requesting for some data on, from the GitHub API. Um, it goes there, it gets to the service layer, the service layer uh, queries the GitHub API, returns the data, persists that to the local GB, and then, so they can have offline functionality uh, supported, and then send it back to me as well, so they can display it uh, on the UI. But it doesn't actually send it back to the view straight, it then sends it back to the view model, which is the one that actually spoke to it in the first place. And the view model um, is powered by uh, the change notifier model, 
will actually then notify the UI, oh, some data has arrived, now rebuild. So, so all these uh, service components are not actually allowed to number one another. So the service API coordinates talking to them. So for example, if uh, I pull data from GitHub endpoints or from the, uh, yeah, GitHub API, GitHub API doesn't know about the database at all, or the GitHub service. You will see it as a HTTP service in the application class. It doesn't know about the database. So when it returns the data to the service uh, API, which I got the repository here, then that data is passed to the local DB by um, the service API initiating the request to do that. And then finally, it returns, it returns to the UI. So this is a very simple uh, way to actually like break down a complex architecture and make it uh, look very simple. I'm, I'm pretty sure a large number of us actually understand the data flow here. And so again, architecture has to simplify complexity. So component interaction two, uh, here we have, uh, which is a pattern that actually, uh, yeah, I'm gonna relate to what's actually, when, okay, let me talk about this flow first and then I'll, I will relate it to the UI that you saw earlier. So the view uh, triggered an action on the view model, the view model called service API, it get me some data about this uh, key profile. And then it goes to the server, pulls out the profile, and then when it returns, it, it passes that to local DB, and then the local DB uh, notifies straight, that sent a straight notification without having to go back through the service API, it sends a straight notification to uh, all the view models that are actually connected to it. It doesn't actually have to be the one that's actually trigger the action. This is actually one of the reasons um, uh, you we have a situation uh, whereby when I favorite uh, a geek or a dev, you see about two or three screens reflected that change. And that's because the service, uh, the data layer, which is a local DB, actually has notification capabilities. It can actually notify the view model straight away without having to go through the service API that, hey, have some new data. And what will actually happen is that the view model will not initiate another action. Okay, since you have some new data, now give it to me. And then we go back to we have this scenario that we have here. But this time around, it doesn't have to, we won't have to have the server play, playing a role here or the network service playing a role here. So yeah, let's see some code. Okay, I have to do this real quickly. I'm just to you better. Where are you? Great. Um, I'll put this on full screen mode so we can see. Now, so if you, I just wanted to just show us a few things here. I'm not, I'm not going to be going into detail about everything you see. Uh, this is typically how I kind of write, write my models. Uh, it's not too different from what you already know. What I know many of us use on a daily basis. Right, so this is actually the service uh, API class that I'm showing you um, on the slide. And if you can see, it has instances of all the services that it needs to work with. Okay, I need to make this bigger. Great. So it has the uh, GitHub API service. Um, it has the Firebase service for authentication. It has the share service. And this actually <laughs> may seem like for some of us, it seems like an overkill, but if you actually, if you're actually mindful of a testable app, of an app that is easily testable, you you will actually not want to bring in external plugins into, the, into your service layer. You have to have them in a different service. If you actually open this, it's just yeah, it just implements a share functionality, which actually uh, uh, uses uh, the share plugin to actually send that to the platform. Um, let me make this bigger. So it's yeah, you don't want to bring you don't want to bring this guy into your service layer because it's a, put something in there that you cannot mock away while testing the service layer. So the GitHub service, uh, more like most, most of us do, you have uh, you have endpoints a method that sort of like queries the 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 API and pull some data in. 
and um, you can also some bit, see some bits of exception handling here. And um, yeah, so just some endpoints method that actually pulls data for you and yeah, and returns that to the service API. So you can see the point of instantiation. Uh, it has a job of, of sort of like uh, declaring, uh, instantiating all the services that you use in the application. You can see the database, the shared service, and all the services. I kind of have it this way just so. So while testing, I can just pass in anything I want to test. It's maybe the more version of these guys, right? So it has a, a lot of method, and one of them that I'm going to show you, I'm going to take a straight move from the view. Uh, uh, let me see one of the screens. Can you show us like the most important method, uh, like the most uh, important method in your opinion? Um, I, I wouldn't say there's anything that is more important than the other here, but I'm just going to show us a flow, uh, a flow from what you saw on the diagram. Right, starting from the view, the view triggering an action, mm -hmm. and then we'll see how that connects to to an extent uh, that you go to the service layer. So uh, I will use the git detail screen. Um, so one of the things I love about providers is that I can just observe the property in my model and only, only review each, a section of my screen only when that changes, which is why I find it very, uh, Great for this architecture. Um, so uh, at the point here, I so, okay. I need to get back to the screen. So this this is the screen, the detail screen, the one that shows uh, the detail about the engineer. If you see uh, at this point here, I'm calling the method load kick profile. So once once we are coming in, uh, but then I have the username of the person I want to load. Now let's flow with that. So that method is inside it, the uh, detail. Uh, let me make this bigger. Man, where's my good gesture notes? Uh, okay, great. <laughs> All right. Because it is messing with me. Um, so in here, you can see stuff around the second handling. Uh, not to, I'm not really here to pay attention to this. You can just look at those, uh, the code later on and actually see everything for yourself. So we have the load. If you notice here and see the way I'm bringing in the service layer, so I'm using get it. Uh, I call it service locator. That's actually very simple. It just runs an instance of get it, which I know many of us do make it. You make use of. Okay, mind you, this is the model, right? So implement uh, a chain notifier model. So the base model actually uh, extend that. So I just can do that to have some flavors that are common to other models. Um, so this is how I bring it in. So while testing, I can actually leverage this and put in any uh, mock service API so I can fully completely test out my uh, view model without having to. Uh, yeah, deal with the complexities of inside of the service API. But if you want to do an uh, integration test or a full flow test, you can also uh, do that as well. Um, okay, so here on the, I'm, I'm calling a uh, load key profile on the API, uh, on the service API. And you can see that. So John, now inside we the are almost, we are already out of time. In uh, totally out of time. So I'll just give you 30 seconds to quickly round up uh, so that we can prepare for the quiz on Slido. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to be quick here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so now when you get in here, uh, you can see it tries to, there's a lot of coordination right here. So this method first doesn't actually go to the API to pull that data. It's, it looks for that data on the local DB. And if it, does, if it finds it, it returns it to you. This is, saves us a lot. But if it doesn't find it, it goes to this uh, GitHub service API and then pulls uh, the data that you want. And then when it finds it, it also passes that to the local DB. 
and and returns the profile to you. So which is one of the scenarios that that we, we actually saw the other time um, on the on the flow charts. Yeah. So that's like the full flow, and see the, you can see the coordination right here. And this is done inside of the service layer, and you can easily test out all this logic here. Uh, you can mock out the service uh, uh, GitHub service. You can mock out uh, um, Firebase service on all the external stuff that you brought into your app. You can completely mock them up and fully test out your service layer. Uh, so it's simple and easy to understand. It has a discrete directional flow, and yeah. So getting out of the code, let me see. I'm jumping back into the slide so that I can finish up. So we have app model. Um, what does it do? So actually, this is actually a very important component of the app that we did actually see. So it can hold data. So just a few more slides and and, and, and I'll, be, I'll be at the end of this talk. So holds application level UI state data, uh, like team, uh, team mode. So it does actually want to control the, uh, the dark mode and the light mode switching. It has the ability to review the entire application, but only do that when necessary. And manages the navigation. So if, if, you not, if you notice from the demo, I was jumping out of a tab level navigation into the main application level navigation. That is possible because uh, the app model holds, uh, holds the navigator states for my main app level navigation stack so that I can always push to that and pop from that from anywhere in the application. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's actually the one in charge of um, triggering the service layer to initialize the database and the initial routing that actually happen in the application. When you run the app, you see the initial routing. So if you're dedicated, it doesn't actually like uh, take it to the onboarding just to see the application straight. Now the repository pattern and what it does, it holds service level uh, states, initializes all the service components of an app and coordinates communications and interaction amongst all the service components of the app, right? And defines an application service level interaction, interaction contract. So it gives a contract. So for example, if you want to change something in the service layer, uh, it actually gives you a contract on what uh, you can actually do. So usually people do have an abstract class that has all the methods that need to be defined by the service API. So if you want to change that out, you have to extend that method and declare all the methods. So it's always an easy, easy switch. And that's actually plays a critical role in a, whole, a critical role in actually uh, in maintaining the app and scaling the app. So, so, so in summary, architectural thinking is answering the what, the, the how, and the why of your solution. And all these, so all these go together in order to have a well architected solution and a properly designed software solution should ensure the following, loose coupling of the different components of the app and a clear communication pattern between the different components of an app, easy to test, maintain, and scale. A predictable app. So your app should have a behavior that you can predict. Not like uh, you have your app in production is doing something else. Your app done staging is doing something else. So that has to be well managed by your architecture. Avoid complexities and tech debt. Satisfy all the requirements of the software while also managing the constraints. So thank you for listening. Uh, I look forward to questions. And then a call for contributions. Uh, this. I'm going to put this uh, this application that I demoed up for contribution. So for any one of us that wants to, uh, you think there's something you want to add to make it better, please. I'm more than happy to get a uh, a pull request from you. And if you feel like you just want to change the text or yeah, maybe just correct a, a, a grammatical error. Yeah, I'm actually more likely to merge up here a lot faster than <laughs> anyone else's. So yeah, any, anything is accepted. So you can get up. Um, yeah, then you can follow me or catch me on, on social media with Adrian Gordon, nothing else. Yeah, that's it. All right, man. Amazing session. Thank you so much for going in depth on uh, how to build architectures. We'll not be taking questions because uh, time is already fast spent. But if you have any questions, please go to Twitter and then tag at Flutter Lagos. 
and you can also tag at John Gorithim using the hashtag Flutter Day Meetups, and then John will try to reply. I uh, would also be emailing and sharing the slides of the speakers on Twitter so that so. Are interested in joining the Flutter Lagos community? You can join the WhatsApp, the Telegram group using the link bit.ly slash FL Telegram, which is displayed on the screen right now. Bit.ly slash FL Telegram. Thank you so much, John, uh, for the amazing session. Uh, it was great having you with us today. Thank you. Thank you as well for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So, hey, guys, uh, uh, thank you so much for attending the Flutter Day event. Uh, to round up the event, I uh, will be having a quick quiz on SLI.do. So, please log on to SLI.do. The event quiz is 1960. Then, when you are in, uh, we'll be starting the quiz in about three minutes from now. So uh, let's just uh, have a little bit of fun. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please follow us on Twitter uh, at Flutter Lagos. Then you can join the community. Don't forget to share your learnings from today uh, on social media. Thank you very much for joining. I will catch you on Slido.